Dear friends and uh, colleagues, my name is Alexander Egermont, and uh, I'm uh, happy to participate and discuss uh, with you the evolution of melanoma therapies from uh, advanced to adjuvant and neoadjuvant therapies. Here are my disclosures, and let's get started. So we've had two uh, revolutions in uh, melanoma development uh, new uh, treatments, uh, one mutation-driven drug development and one uh, innovative uh, immunomodulation. I just want to make one remark about the BRF mutant melanomas. So for a long time, we thought that the BRF MEK inhibitor combo, Dubrafenib plus Trimethinib, or any other BRF MEK inhibitor combo uh, would be uh, the most obvious and potentially best solution to treat uh, BRF mutant melanomas. And by double blocking this uh, pathway by, with a BRF inhibitor and a MEK inhibitor, uh, we uh, established uh, results uh, that are depicted here uh, with a three-year 44% overall survival and a five-year 34% overall survival. Put those numbers in your head because we will demonstrate that with immuno-oncology management of advanced melanoma, the results are actually uh, much better. So innovative immunomodulation was uh, the biggest revolution in uh, melanoma management over the last 10 years, and it's all defined by two master regulator monoclonal antibodies, anti-CTLA-4 and anti-D1. Anti-CTLA-4 enhances priming of T cells, mostly in the lymph nodal compartment, and this way you create a continued priming of T cells that leads to multiple T cell clones that go into the circulation and then will reach the metastatic tumors. At the tumor side, these T cell clones that express PD1 on their surface bind to PDL1 ligands on tumor cells or macrophages and other microenvironment components, and then they're being neutralized. So you must protect your T cell effector function with anti-PD-1 or anti-PD-L1. And uh, these molecules are the most effective in immunoactivation uh, and protection of uh, the immune system. And so what we saw with anti-CTLA-4 alone as monotherapy, this was the first molecule, uh, we saw a modest response rate of 20%, an overall survival rate in advanced melanoma of 20%. So you can cure about 20% of melanoma patients with just anti-CTLA-4. You see here 20% overall survival at five years and at 10 years. With the anti-PD-1, you achieve higher response rates, 40 to 45%, and you, see you get overall survival rates in advanced melanoma patients of 40 to 45%. These are the first results of the Keynote 001 pembrolizumab uh, trial. So in the subsequent Keynote trial, the 006 trial, look at the right-hand panel. In treatment-naive advanced melanoma patients, there was a 43% five-year overall survival, as is depicted here. And in another trial, the nivolumab, uh, uh, anti-PD-1, where a comparison was made between the bottom curve, anti-CTLA-4 monotherapy, the blue curve, anti-PD-1, nivolumab monotherapy, and the green curve, the combination of anti-CTLA-4 plus anti-PD-1, ipilimumab plus nivolumab, a 52% overall survival rate at five years. Look again at the monotherapy anti-PD-1 curve, five-year overall survival rate of 44%. So these numbers are now carved in stone, and they are clearly superior to the 34, 35% overall survival rate with uh, anti <clears throat> with a BRF MEK inhibitor combo for the BRF mutant melanoma patients. Look at another combination of anti-PD-1, embrolizumab in this case, plus, plus low-dose ipilimumab, this trial, the Keynote 29, 
you see fantastic overall survival data at three years of 73%. And just two weeks ago, it was reported that the five-year overall survival rate in that trial was in treatment-naive advanced melanoma patients, and it was 68.3%. So these numbers are clearly superior to what you might expect in BRF mutant uh, um, melanomas with BRF mec uh, combo therapies. But when you look at the BRF mutant melanoma population, even inside that older trial, with the nivolumab and the ipi nevo combination, you see that for the BRF mutant melanoma patients, there was already a 60% overall survival at five years. And this is clearly much better than the 34% for BRF mutant patients with the brafinib plus trametinib. And so we can state that immunotherapy really rules supremely in advanced melanoma. So for BRF mutant melanoma patients, there were triple therapy trials. One with the PDL1 atezolizumab added to a BRF MEC inhibitor combo, and one with the anti PD1 spartalizumab in combination with the Dubrafnib plus Dermatinib BRF MEC inhibitor combo. Now, these two triple treatments basically had the same progression free survival rates difference was only 10 days, yet one trial was just positive and the other trial was just negative. But the big lacking uh, element in the design of these trials was that there should have been three arms in these trials, and not just the brf mec inhibitor combo comparing its efficacy to the triple combo, but also simply an anti-PD-1 or anti-PDL-1 mono therapy arm. This was not done in these trials. And if it would have been done, it would have demonstrated that the anti-PD-1 monotherapy was basically at least as good as the triple therapy, and that these are inferior to the anti-PD-1 plus anti-CTLA-4 treatment options. So this whole triple therapy, I think, is a deflated balloon and will not find any uh, significant utility in uh, advanced uh, BRF mutant melanoma patients. And then just two weeks ago at the Society of Melanoma Research uh, uh, meeting and at uh, the ASCO plenary series, the results of the DreamSeq uh, trial were uh, discussed and presented by Mike Atkins. And this trial is in BRF mutant melanoma patients advanced melanoma patients, where the patients were randomized to receive either ipilimumab plus nivolumab, followed by nivolumab monotherapy maintenance therapy first, and then at progression, they would receive the brafinib plus trametinib, brf -MEC combo inhibitor uh, treatment. Or they would start with the brf -MEC inhibitor combo, and at progression would receive the Limumab nivolumab uh, combination therapy. And the question was, would it make a difference with which treatment you would start in these BRF mutant melanoma patients? And the results are absolutely striking. What it shows in terms of progression free survival is that only for the first seven, eight months, uh, the BRF MEC inhibitor combo has a slight advantage for progression free survival. But then curves cross, and the patients who started with uh, ipilimumab and nivolumab combination are doing far better uh, than the patients who started with a BRF-MEC uh, combo and then switched at progression to uh, ipilimumab and nivolumab. The difference here, as you can see, is uh, some 23% uh, at uh, 24 months in progression-free survival. And in overall survival, you see that same striking 20% difference in overall survival, benefiting the patients who started with ipilimumab plus nivolumab, in spite of being a BRF mutant melanoma patient, 
and that these results are far better than if you start with a BRF MEC combo, dubrafenib plus trametinib, and then switch to ipilimumab plus nivolumab. And so this trial clearly positions the combination of anti ctl 4 plus anti-PD-1 as the best starting therapy in advanced melanoma. Also for the BRF mutant melanoma patients. Then there's been another uh, new molecule that shows that it can articulate well in combination with anti-PD-1, and it's the molecule anti-LAC3, relatlimab. These data were presented at ASCO in 2021, randomized trials where the combination of relatlimab plus nivolumab was compared to nivolumab alone in treatment-naive uh, advanced melanoma patients. And what it showed was that the combination did better than the uh, anti p one monotherapy uh, uh, treatment, um, and that this particular uh, result was significant at uh, 12 months in terms of progression-free survival, the primary endpoint of this trial. There is a little caveat with this trial, uh, or perhaps it's not that little. We saw that the monotherapy with nivolumab had a median progression-free survival of only 4.6 months, and this is extraordinarily low, uh, um, much lower than what we have seen in prior trials, and that the combination of nivolumab plus relatlimab at about uh, 10 months um, is uh, a median progression-free survival. But in some trials, we have actually seen with monotherapy with anti-PD-1, so we're still a bit puzzled by the results of this uh, trial. All in all, it's clear that it's very hard, it's so hard to break the anti p one ceiling of effectivity. When we look at the T cells and the inhibitory receptors, which we can address with anti-CTLA4, anti-PD-1, and anti-LAG3, that these strategies have worked so far, but that combinations with activating receptors any of these receptors so far have all failed. And so that combination of two inhibitory receptor blocking antibodies has been the best strategy in immunocombo development. And so basically the anti p one molecules are central to the strategy now in multiple tumor types, not just melanoma, but across the board in more than 20 uh, different uh, tumor types that we are running uh, now up to 3,000 different trials where anti-PD-1 or anti pd one is the central molecule. And on top of that, we give, for instance, anti ctl 4 or chemotherapy or radiation therapy or um, angiogenesis blockers or VEGF uh, inhibitors or any type of targeted uh, therapy or vaccine or other uh, combination uh, molecule. The core molecule is always anti p one or anti ctla 4 In the further development of immunotherapy combo development, we therefore must look at what we already have achieved, and that is enhancing CTL priming with anti ctla 4 and protecting CTL effector function with anti pd one or anti pd one And then now we need to address the third compartment in uh, the tumors, which is dominated by macrophages that are profoundly immunosuppressive, and that those associated macrophages can block with anti-interferon gamma receptor 2 monoclonal antibodies, or we can change the tail of our anti-PD-1s or anti pd ones so that uh, they cannot be taken off uh, the T cell um, uh, that is protected by those antibodies by macrophages. And there, the, the example is, for instance, Prolgolimab, the, the Russian BioCat uh, anti-PD-1 uh, molecule, very innovative. Then we have anti-CD47 and anti-SERP-alpha antibodies that can also uh, enhance macrophage function and, and avoid the blocking function of uh, macrophages. And we have to M1 repolarization agents that drive the M2 very immunosuppressive uh, macrophages into immunoactive uh, uh, macrophages, the M1 uh, 
macrophages, and we have different agents, CCR5, CCR5-2. Uh, we have galactin-3 inhibitors and uh, depleters, and a number of strategies. And so when you look at a very innovative and, and nice uh, molecule, uh, by modulating the FC part of your anti-P1 molecule, you have actually Prolgolimab, and this is the publication in the European Journal of uh, Cancer in 2021 of your Miraculum uh, trial conducted in, uh, in Russia. And when you look at the two-year Miraculum overall survival data, you see that uh, there is a 64% two-year overall survival. You're in the right upper-hand curve for all cutaneous melanoma patients. And when you look at the three-year update data, you see that at three years, the overall survival data is 55%. And this com is comparable or even better than the Keynote 006 data, where it was 51%. So this Prolgolimab uh, antibody uh, seems to be very good and compare at least as good as the other anti-PD-1 molecules that are around. Then we said that blocking the macrophages recept gamma receptor 2, FC gamma receptor 2, would protect further T cell function. Look at the bottom panel here, where anti FC gamma receptor 2 monoclonal antibodies cover macrophages and therefore inhibit that the macrophages can take off the anti PD1s from the P1 uh, expression. Uh, CTLs and therefore protect them for further functioning. And so the CTLs remain activated and their function is um, enhanced. So it's yet another strategy to enhance um, T cell function by protecting them against macrophages, M2 macrophages. The same thing is true for macrophage checkpoint blockage with anti CD47s and anti. Serp alpha. In this pathway, you must block the don't eat me signal, CD47, with either anti CD47 or anti Serp alpha, which is on the macrophages. And if you do so, then you avoid that the don't uh, eat me signal uh, on tumor cells is functional and protects tumor cells against uh, T cell, uh, tumor cell kill. So when you look at the Friedman's uh, article in uh, Nature uh, Reviews of uh, Clinical Oncology, they published the infiltrate analysis on 10,000 tumors. And what was a common denominator in being very immunosuppressive and bad prognostics was the amount of M2 macrophages that you found in all those tumors. And so we need to tackle the M2 tumor-associated macrophage population to make the next advanced in immunotherapy combo development. And one of the ways how to do that is, for instance, by galactin-3 inhibition or depletion, because galactin-3 high concentrations lead to M2 macrophage uh, activation and therefore very deep immunosuppressive activity. And if you deplete galactin-3 in the tumor microenvironment, then you get the shift back from M2 to M1 macrophages and you get enhanced or cell killing. So when you've taken care of those three elements now, CTL priming, CTL effector, cell function protection, and macrophage neutralization of uh, that uh, M2 uh, immunosuppressive function, there is still a number of immune escape mechanisms that you may need to tackle, check one, check two mutations, and loss of gamma interferon pathways, uh, uh, loss of uh, class one molecules, beta cathein uh, pathway activation, which can lead to immune exclusion, and T cell exhaustion, which you can uh, counteract by anti LAC3 monoclonal antibodies. But these are then just some remaining mechanisms of immunosuppression that you may need to tackle. Then on top of that, you may combine with smarter cytokines to especially prevent a T regulatory cell, very immunosuppressive T cells, tsunami, which is what you see with regular interleukin-2. So BEMPAC, MKTR214, uh, the nectar, uh, uh, interleukin-2 or the Neovia interleukin-2 are interleukins that 
that is, avoid the uh, big expansion of T regulatory T cells. And so, for instance, with this uh, BAMPAC Aldus leucan molecule, BAMPAC, in combination with anti PD1, nivolumab, there is a trial comparing it with nivolumab monotherapy, both in the advanced melanoma setting as well as in the adjuvant uh, setting. And then, of course, the other uh, question is what about vaccines? Well, vaccines alone and by themselves don't work, but they can work and they have a second life now in their development because of anti PD1. Because vaccines can work provided the effector cells that are enhanced by your vaccine are protected by anti PD1. And a good example is what was uh, reported at ESMO in 2020 and published in Nature Medicine in 2021. And that is that the immune oncology uh, 102 slash 103 anti IDO anti PL1 vaccine against immunosuppressive cells. There are myeloid derived suppressor cells two uh, suppressor cells and T regulatory cells that that vaccine in combination with nivolumab is reported in 30 patients to have in advanced melanoma patients an 80% overall response rate, a 50% complete response rate, and a median progression-free survival rate of uh, more than uh, 31 months. And that this approach therefore now got breakthrough status the FDA and is going to be put to the test in a randomized phase three trial uh, of the combination of anti PD1 and relizumab plus this double anti immunosuppressive cell vaccine in Europe, where you see all the countries involved, and uh, uh, Australia, New Zealand, the US, and uh, Latin America. So overall, we have seen now that in advanced melanoma, top of the bill is the combination of ipilimumab plus nivolumab, and then nivolumab monotherapy, and that this is true for all melanomas, also for RF mutant melanomas. Does it translate from the advanced setting into the adjuvant setting? Yes, it completely linearly translates into what we have observed in the adjuvant setting. What have we observed in the adjuvant setting? That the first molecule, ipilimumab, in the advanced setting also was the first molecule approved for lymph node positive melanoma stage three in the, adju in the adjuvant setting. That nivolumab was shown to be superior to ipilimumab, just like in, in the advanced setting, also in the adjuvant setting. That the brevnib plus trametinib was an alternative for direct mutant melanomas in the adjuvant setting. And that embrolizumab and that E1 was the other molecule clearly superior to placebo in lymph node positive uh, uh, stage three melanomas in the adjuvant setting. So advanced translated into adjuvant observations and approvals. A trial where there was little crossover after a relapse and that was the EORTC 18071 ipilimumab versus placebo trial in stage three melanoma. We showed that what you see in terms of impact on relapse-free survival is long lasting. It translates exactly into basically the same as a ratio for distant metastasis-free survival, and translates into the same observation on the impact on overall survival. The problem of the dosing of ipilimumab at milligrams per kg was the high rate of immune related adverse events. But anyway, it was rapidly replaced uh, by um, the brafenib plus trametinib in BRF mutant melanoma patients, the top curve versus placebo, the bottom curve, or anti p one uh, nivolumab, the top curve versus the bottom curve, an active treatment, ipilimumab, in this uh, checkpoint uh, 3A trial, or again, Lizumab in the Keynote 54 trial, which shows this top curve in lymph node positive melanoma patients, regardless of uh, BRF mutational status, just so for all melanoma patients, clearly superior to uh, placebo. So an absolute difference of about 20% at uh, three years. It was true for PDL1 
positive as well as PDL1 negative patient. It was true at the same hazard ratios of around 0 0.50, 55, 0 0.56, 0 0.57 for different substages of stage 3, A, B, C, with no positive melanoma patients. And it was true even more so in BRF mutant patients, an absolute difference at three years of 25%, benefiting the pembrolizumab arm, top curve versus pembrolizumab versus uh, placebo arm, bottom curve, um, uh, which actually is better than what was observed in the combi AD, the brefinib plus trametinib trial. So I show this in this trial. At three years with pembrolizumab, we see a 25% absolute difference in the stage three melanoma patient population compared to a 20% difference in the combi AD, uh, uh, the same population uh, trial. It also translates in the pembrolizumab trial into exactly the same observations for distant metastasis-free survival. Here, relapse-free survival. Here, distant metastasis-free survival at three and a half years, which we published in Lancet Oncology this year. And again, for the BRF muted patients, the best effect here, 20% absolute difference uh, for distant metastasis-free survival for pembrolizumab compared to placebo, whereas it was only 14% in the COMBI-AD trial. And so, the last question then was, would we also see superiority of the combination of anti-CTL4 plus anti-PD-1 in the adjuvant setting? And there's two trials. One trial was published already in 2020 in the highest risk patient population trial, resected stage four melanoma patients. German trial, the Immunet trial, and it compared the combination of nivolumab plus ipilimumab, but ipilimumab dosed at three milligrams per kg every three weeks. Very important, put that into your head, compared to nivolumab, um, compared to placebo. And here the combination with ipilimumab is superior in terms of progression-free survival compared to monotherapy with anti-PD-1 compared to placebo. Then, we had the largest trial conducted, Checkmate 915, in 2,000 patients comparing nivolumab plus ipilimumab versus nivolumab monotherapy. But this is quite different in the sense that nivolumab was dosed every two weeks at 240 milligrams as a flat dose, but ipilimumab here was dosed at a very low dose, one milligrams per kg, not every three weeks, but only every six weeks compared to nivolumab monotherapy, compared to ipilimumab monotherapy. Now look here, that dose of ipilimumab is six times lower than the dosing of ipi at three weeks, uh, um, intervals at three milligrams per kg, which is the approved dosing of ipilimumab. And so this is what happened in this trial. Ipilimumab was clearly underdosed and there was no more beneficial effect of the combination over uh, adjuvant therapy with uh, nivolumab with anti-PD-1 alone. There's one more trial out there, which I already mentioned. It's that uh, new type of interleukin-2 that does not create all those uh, T regulatory cells. It's the combination of BEMPAC with nivolumab versus nivolumab monotherapy in the adjuvant setting stage three and resected stage four patients. That trial will, uh, is still uh, accruing and will only read out uh, in, uh, in about two years or so. So then the question is, what's next in the adjuvant setting? In the adjuvant setting, the next question then is, how about adjuvant therapy in stage 2BC melanoma patients? Stage 2BC melanoma patients, you have as many patients in that category as you have stage 3 melanoma patients, where you have all your approved uh, adjuvant therapies. And if you go even lower, stage 1 to A, well, the relapse rates there are much lower. And there you can only uh, identify patients by using tests on the primary melanoma. So let's discuss and see what's going to happen. So here you see that stages 2B inside the, the red box, stages 2B, 3B, and 2C have very similar 
overall survival rates at five and at 10 years, and therefore have a similar risk of relapse. Whereas the stages 2b and 2c are simply central node negative. So the size of the overall populations is that stage 2a is as big as stage 2b plus 2c, is as big as stage 3a, b, c, d. And so the question then was, what about anti-P1 adjuvant therapy in stage 2b, c melanoma? Because there, at least, you have a relapse rate of uh, uh, 25 to 50% uh, uh, at, uh, at uh, five years. And so there's two trials, the Keynote 716 trials and the Checkmate uh, 76K trial. But the Keynote trial already now was reported. It was reported at ESMO, and it was reported for an update on, at the Society of Melanoma Research uh, only a couple of weeks ago. And let's look at the results here for adjuvant therapy for one year with pembrolizumab versus placebo in stage 2BC melanoma patients. And here you see the updated analysis as presented only two weeks ago at the Society of Melanoma Research. So look at the 18 months differences. It's almost 86% for adjuvant therapy with pembrolizumab, 77% uh, relapse-free uh, survival for um, uh, the uh, placebo uh, patient uh, population. The hazard ratio is 0.61. And if you also include the reduction of new primary melanomas, the hazard ratio is 0.60. So you see the same 40% reduction of new primary melanomas, as you see in terms of relapses uh, with the anti-P1 uh, therapy. Does it work for different group, the PT3B, PT4A, and PT4B? Yes, it's remarkably uh, effective in the uh, stage. Uh, this is combined stage uh, to B. And in stage uh, to see the difference is somewhat smaller with a hazard ratio of um, hazard ratio of 0 0.82, but overall it's 0 0.61. And so approval of anti-PD1 of anti of pembrolizumab for stage 2BC is basically going to be imminent and is expected by the end of this year. And this approval by the FDA. And so then. Uh, it also means what if you would include stage 2a, so if you would look at all of stage 2 melanoma and stage 2a, the relapse rate is much lower. So then you will need to identify with a high risk score using a gene profiling, uh, uh, gene expression profile test on the primary melanoma. Is it a high risk? Then you can include it into randomization or is it a low risk? And then you only uh, basically propose observation. This is what happens in the NIVO Mala adjuvant therapy uh, trial in uh, Germany. And um, in the Netherlands, we have developed uh, uh, another uh, uh, algorithm to identify patients who are at high risk for relapse in spite of being central node negative. And that's by using two clinical uh, pathologic characteristics that we always know in all patients its age of the patient and its Breslow thickness of the primary melanoma, and eight genes that define high metastatic propensity in a gene expression profiling test that you can do on your primary melanoma. And this CPGP algorithm we published in the European Journal of Cancer in 2020. And look what happened in 854 patients of the Mayo Clinic in the United States. So if you were central node negative and algorithm low risk, you are in the light blue curve on top. Relapse-free survival, you have very, very few uh, relapses uh, at five years. It's only uh, uh, some uh, uh, 10 to 11% of relapses. If you are both central node positive and uh, CPGP algorithm uh, high risk, you are on the curve at the bottom. Look at the dark blue curve. These are all sentinel node negative patients, but they still relapse. 30% still relapses at five years, and they are all 
identified by the high-risk CPGEP algorithm outcome. It also translates in that observation for uh, death free survival and overall survival. And so that is going to be the test that will change a lot of things because it means that you can identify patients in spite of being the central node negative to be at high risk for relapse. And it's therefore a test that can basically replace central node staging. The last revolution is the neoadjuvant immunotherapy revolution. And it all started in the top here, palpable macroscopic stage three melanoma. And these observations are truly revolutionary because they will lead to more cures, shorter treatment circles, cycles, and less surgery. And it will be a rollout from melanoma into colorectal cancer, into bladder cancer, locally advanced cutaneous squamous cell cancer, and multiple other trials. And so what happened was the following. That if you give neoadjuvant anti-CTLA4 plus anti-PD1, you can get fantastic responses in patients with palpable nodal melanoma. And then you score on those lymph nodes after neoadjuvant therapy, and you will find out that if you have a pathologic major response, you will almost see no more relapses in these patients. And they actually seem to be potentially cured with just two courses of therapy prior to surgery. And this was all developed at the NKI in the Netherlands first by uh, Christian Blanc and uh, Schumacher, where they compared neoadjuvant epilimab, blue, versus first doing the surgery and then adjuvant uh, epinevo combination therapy. And they measured T cell clones that were expanded, the ones who were already present at baseline, or the new cell, new clones that were induced with the adjuvant therapy depicted here. Look, everything is much, much, much bigger in terms of diversity of T cell clones induced as well as multiplication of T cell clones, new ones or already existing ones by neoadjuvant therapy, working with the tumor load in the lymph nodes. And that diversity of T cell clones and magnitude of the armies of T cell clones means that you are actually going to cure patients. And that's the force of neoadjuvant therapy. Look at the right hand side. If you had a major pathologic response, basically saw no more relapses in uh, these patients. And these were patients with palpable nodal disease. And that's the green curve. And so in a consortium pooled analysis, you see that neoadjuvant immunotherapy that's anti-PD1 based is completely superior. If you have a major response, a pathologic partial complete or near complete response, you see almost no more lapses after that treatment. Whereas if you do that with drabrafenib plus trametinib in BRF mutant melanomas, you see some effect in the pathologic complete responders, but you see basically no effect on relapses in the partial responders. So there is superiority of immunotherapy in melanoma everywhere, in advanced disease, in neoadjuvant setting, and probably also in the adjuvant setting. And if you give this neoadjuvant epinevo, and this is 100 patients uh, uh, where they uh, actually put a lymph node marker uh, in the largest lymph node, that's here in the light blue box, you give two courses of epilimumab plus nivolumab, and then you take out just that one largest lymph node that was marked with a little magnet. And if it's a pathologic complete or near complete response, you don't do a completion lymph node or therapeutic lymph node dissection anymore. That was true in 60% of patients who did not need any therapeutic lymph node dissections anymore. And they didn't even get any further um, adjuvant uh, therapy. So all they got was two cycles of neoadjuvant epi uh, nevo. And so this is a true revolution. It started in melanoma, will lead to much fewer therapeutic lymph node dissections and more cures. And it's rolled out in bladder cancer, 50% of pathologic complete responses with neoadjuvant anti-PD-1. 
mesai colorectal cancer, 95% pathologic complete responses for rectal cancers are MSI and uh, are rolled out in different uh, tumor types. And so that's where the landscape is going. This is where immunotherapy is completely changing the management of melanoma patients. And uh, I hope you're all prepared for this and going to participate in all uh, the trials that will lead to these uh, predictions. I thank you very much for your attention.